Thank you very much, Jacko, and thank you, Mark, for inviting me here this afternoon. And thank you all for staying as well. I know that the weather is closing in, but it's fantastic that you've all uh, stayed after lunch for this really important session on the Covenant. Um, so listen, Helen Halliwell, Director of Armed Forces People Policy in the Ministry of Defence. Um, I think there's no greater function of government than the defence of our nation, our overseas territories, and that of our allies. And it's the responsibility of our armed forces to deliver that on our behalf, but they can't do it on their own. They need to do it as part of a wider ecosystem. And that is one that you are very much part of. So very grateful for everybody being here today. Um, I joined Defence over 20 years ago, and some of my very early posts, I think, have probably really shaped the career that I've had since then. So a couple of stories. The first, um, after being in Defence a couple of years, I was really fortunate to fly to Lisbon and join HMS Grimsby a mine countermeasure vessel going through the Mediterranean and Lisbon, uh, for searching for mines after World War II. Uh, I spent a week on board, got to see all parts of the ship, all kind of shifts, and really talk to the people on board and understand what made them tick a little bit, the sacrifices that they were making on a six-month deployment, the life events they missed back at home, young mothers, young fathers, um, kind of really sang to me. And just kind of the sheer variety of work that they got involved in, whether that was diplomacy whilst on board and various visitors they had and the very important tasks that they were there for. I enjoyed it so much that when I came back within a couple of weeks, I'd gone down to HMS President in, in London and joined the Royal Navy Reserves um, and I joined the medical branch. Um, and it was soon after that that we were involved with Iraq and some of our medical branch went out to support. So um, a huge proud moment for the, for the unit in being part and involved in that. And then I think uh, the second, shortly after that, I worked at PGHQ uh, in what was then the kind of underground bunker on the operational side for Afghanistan. This was really early days, 2005-06, um, where I was responsible for kind of operational deployment. I only got to visit theatre three times, and that was only, you know, a week, just over a week each time. But the things that I got to see there and the people that I got to work with whilst out there, whether it's in... Meza Sharif in Kabul, in Helmand, in Kandahar, you know, colleagues that I've been working with in, in head office wearing suits in their camo uh, with their machine guns and doing some, you know, really tough stuff and the accountability, the responsibility, the sacrifices again that they made uh, has kind of shaped some of the pace that I've had since then. Uh, one of the responsibilities was reporting on our wounded, injured and sick as well and it's a privilege to count some of those as really close friends um, since those days. So that's kind of really shaped some of the work that I've done on the Armed Forces Covenant. So soon after that uh, work in Afghanistan, I went to the prison service, uh, not in prisons but in the prison service headquarters, working for a couple of years, uh, working with um, prisons and restructuring prisons. I then spent a bit of time in DFID and with the Foreign Office and then I was delighted to be called back to the Ministry of Defence in 2010 to set up the Armed Forces Covenant and get that into legislation over 10 years ago now and to produce our first um, departmental publication scheme on what we were doing for the Covenant. And I know that I'm preaching to the converted here, but I do know there are some companies who haven't signed the Armed Forces Covenant who are in the room that I spoke to you over lunch. So it is just worth reminding ourselves, I think, um, on what the Armed Forces Covenant is all about. So three key principles we brought into legislation. Um, recognising the unique obligations and sacrifices made by the armed forces, so whether that's the kind of work that they get involved in, the kind of experiences they have, sacrifices they make on family life, um, and the obligations that they have to do day to day. Removing disadvantage and accessing goods and services because they're employed as part of the armed forces. A lot of this is due to mobility requirements, particularly, I think, with the army moving around every couple of years, um, the effect that has uh, on partner and spousal employment, which we'll come to talk about, places on NHS waiting lists, children's education, um, and just disadvantaging in accessing some of the services. And I'll talk a little bit about that when we talk about you as a business. Um, in terms of if you're, if you're away for six months, nine months at a time, the ability to be able to cancel insurance or cancel subscriptions with no financial penalty, etc. And then, of course, the really important principle, the third principle, which is to consider special provision for those that have given the most, such as the injured and bereaved. And that's, for me as a policymaker, the Armed Forces Common is a fantastic framework that you can, we can use with local authorities, with the NHS, other government departments, to really say these are the reasons why we need to think differently about how we support our Armed Forces community. And it's a fantastic lens for you to think about um, as businesses and employers as well. So if I just think um, briefly about 
you as a business. I've put it here about advocating through your supply chain. You're here in the, in the room because you're, you're fans of the Armed Forces Covenant. You get it, you understand it. So a really important principle, particularly for the gold alumni that are here as well, is about how you advocate this through your supply chain and you get everybody uh, supporting us in this way. And then, of course, through innovation. So we don't have all the bright ideas uh, working in defence or working in Whitehall. We really do look to you, look to learn from you about how you can best support us and what more we should be doing to support you um, in, your, in your businesses as well. And then I think really important to celebrate. So celebrate the armed forces community that are within your businesses. I think veterans are really good at helping other veterans. So that peer support, that peer network is really important. So champion and... and and give them a, a, a platform, I guess, to tell their stories. It's fascinating when you hear reservists, veterans, the kind of roles that they had and that responsibility, that accountability, and you see them in a completely different guise when they're then working in civilian world. So storytelling, really important. And then as employers, so speaking to the kind of the HR, the people function, we've heard already about um, the things that you can do to support reserve service in your companies. Uh, and Jesse Owen, Director of Office of Veterans Affairs, is going to talk after me about service leavers and supporting veterans. Of course, we have 15,000 people that leave every year. Um, and, so, and they often leave, actually, about four to six years of service, I think, is, is the average. So they've got a lot of their working life left. Um, so what we can do to support service leavers, and I'll talk a bit about that under our support. But what I really want to emphasise as well is family members, be that spouses, partners, children of armed, armed forces. Again, the spouse and partner, if, you, you know, if you're deploying for six months at a time, nine months at a time, the spouse and partner is often the one that's left at home with the family. It's like being a single parent family. If you're moving around all the time, you don't have that close network of friends and family necessarily to help support you. So it'd be quite a lonely place, and I speak to a lot of spouses and partners who uh, can get employment, but at a, a really basic level because they are moving around, they're moving companies a lot, and sometimes they do face discrimination if, they, if the employer finds that from an armed forces family, because again, they think they're only going to be around for a couple of years before they leave. So particularly for national companies, think about how you can support serving spouses and serving partners, but also think, I think Laura, you talked about um, remote working and helping us to facilitate that. It's really tricky as well for our partners who are serving a company overseas, particularly with Brexit, much harder for them to work if they're accompanying their serving person overseas. So just have a think about what you can do, particularly to support family members and children as well, um, particularly the 18 to 25 bracket, um, because they've had disrupted education, what more we can do to make it more an equitable playing field, I guess. And apprentices have come up a lot in the discussions that I've had um, over lunch as well. Um, in terms of our support, we heard from Alden and Zoe earlier um, about holistic through career and beyond. So making sure that our skills match to skills that you are looking for um, in the civilian civilian um, companies, um, but it's not just about skills. We also really concentrate on life skills as well, financial management, healthy relationships, work a lot on health and well-being, on mental fitness and mental resili resilience, and that's obviously something that our personnel take with them as they leave the armed forces. We've also um, heard a little bit about the Career Transition Partnership and obviously the store downstairs, if you haven't seen it yet. 12,000 companies have signed up to the CTP. It's free to sign up if you haven't signed up already. Have a Google. You can advertise your, your jobs there. I think there's 20,000 companies in total signed up, but only 12,000 are active. So please, if you're signing up, make sure that you're an active company through the CTP as well. Um, real privilege to chair the Armed Forces Covenant Fund Trust. We get £10 million of funding from the Ministry of Defence to support serving people, families and veterans out in the community. The one thing I wanted to plug a space in this context is the Knowledge Network. So if you haven't seen the Knowledge Network, there's lots of um, examples on there of the projects that we funded, what's worked really well, but also research about what are the barriers to employment for our leavers, our families, our spouses and partners. So it's definitely worth having a look at that um, as well about some practical tips on what you can do to produce that equitable barrier, reduce the barrier and make sure that we're being equitable. And Jesse will talk about the um, survey on, on veterans as well, which has got some fantastic data on it. And then we've got the Armed Forces Families Fund, which the Covenant Fund Trust um, administer on the department's behalf. Um, and again, this is to support children in education, but also to support spouses and partners as well. And I did want to plug the Forces Families job uh, portal. They also have a stand downstairs. Um, 
again, to facilitate employment with spouses and partners. So if you haven't signed up to that, again, it's a free thing for you as employees to sign up to. You get a fantastic uh, stream of talent um, available to you. And also they are really um, trying to increase the number of apprenticeships that service children are part of as well. So do have a, have a chat with them and Google them as well. Um, I'm underrepresented cohort, so I know that we need to do much better on this in defence. We want to learn from you, um, but we're also really conscious that sometimes our pathways uh, are too designed around a, a particular, you know, the, the mass that we have, which tends to be white male. So we need to think about what are we doing to support different cohorts that are leaving. Um, female veterans, what may they want that is different to what the, the male veterans want, and to really think about um, diversifying our offer to suit everybody that's part of defence to transition successfully out. Um, and wounded, injured, sick, obviously, um, less likely to be employed than our abled, bodied, bodied people, but as uh, JC will refer to when he speaks on the panel for Mission Motorsport, um, we need to encourage and we need to make available, we need to adapt what, uh, what support that we offer people in employment terms who may be wounded, injured, and less able. Um, again, you know, the, the cohort that has sacrificed the most in defending the nation and our overseas allies. And we need to really think about how we are encouraging them to have fulfilling uh, careers outside of defence and, and realise their potential as civilians and to serve once again in, in a very different guise. So, again, just thinking about how we can adapt our programmes to support the wounded, injured, sick cohort. So I will think I will leave it there. Um, very happy to take more questions on the panel. And uh, I'd like to welcome Jesse Owen, Director of Office of Veterans Affairs, who's going to come and talk about all the work that they do. Thanks very much. Thanks, Helen. Um, so, yes, I'm Jesse. I'm the director of the Office for Veterans Affairs. We were established in 2019 um, as part of the Cabinet Office to put some uh, real emphasis and focus in government on uh, veterans as civilians as they, once they move out of uh, military service, sitting outside of the MOD to really recognise the fact that they are, in fact, civilians and that helping the veteran community is about bringing together health. It's about what DWP do. It's about what local authorities and the health service do. It's a lot more than what MOD provide. So our role is to uh, work right across government with the public sector, private sector, local authorities, devolved administrations, to make sure that the support that veterans need is available to them, but also to provide sort of leadership, strategic direction to how we can best uh, sort of enable uh, this cohort of uh, service leavers. Our overall ambition, as uh, anyone who's listened to uh, our Minister for Veterans Affairs, Johnny Mercer, will know, is to make this the best country in the world to be a veteran. And my interpretation of that is that veterans can really thrive once they leave and whatever they go on to do in employment, in their communities and in their family uh, life. A key part of that is, uh, is employment. Uh, and by that, I don't just mean having a job, but having a career. And not just uh, every veteran having an individual career, but how do we make sure that we are making use of our veteran community as a sort of strategic economic asset? And that's something that we in the centre of government are really focused on, because obviously we want what's best for every individual, but also how can we really ensure that this, this massive and um, really capable community of people that we have in the veteran sphere are absolutely maximising um, their impact that they can have on the UK economy. So I really want your support in helping us think about how we can um, make best use of our veterans to help our economy grow, to give us sort of strategic advantage in some of the sectors that we've identified are kind of going to be most important for the future of this country, whether that's science and technology, digital, renewables, <coughs> construction, financial services. You know, we're pretty confident that veterans uh, are an insufficiently tapped asset and we need to think about how we can really make use of them. And that's not just, there's not just a moral case for doing that, because it's, you know, that we, they've kind of the service and sacrifice that they have made by being in our armed forces. I really think there's a strong sort of economic um, and national interest aspect to it. It's a core part of having a defence capability is looking after the people that have uh, served in defence, but also making sure that we can get continued utility by contributing to that broader defence ecosystem. A strong defence depends on a strong economy, and I'm convinced that veterans contribute to that strong economy. So, uh, I guess my key message is that veterans don't really uh, don't really need help, but they can help you in your businesses. So. Um, why should you care? If you're here, you probably already know to care about veterans. So some, to some extent, I'm telling you what you already know. But if you can help spread that message sort of far and wide along your networks, that will help. 
Helen mentioned the census, uh, which has given us a really rich data set about who our veterans are and where they are and what they're like. So it's a completely unprecedented amount of information that we now have um, based on the census last year. There are 1.85 million veterans uh, in England and Wales. It probably means there's just over 2 million across the whole of the UK. Uh, we know that they're geographically clustered and that hopefully that's really useful and interesting information if you're keen to recruit veterans and make the most of them, you know sort of where to target. We also know that just uh, about half of veterans are under 65, so they're of working age. They're very much not the stereotype sort of elderly, served in World War II sort of picture that often people have when they think about uh, veterans. Uh, we know absolutely that the military invests in its people. I think I'm right in saying it's still the number one provider of apprenticeships in the country. People get unprecedented levels of training, not just in technical skills, but in leadership and management. People leave the military um, having had, you know, been invested in, in unlike uh, anything I've seen in the civil service, if I can say that in this room. Um, so, uh, you know, we know that there is actually strong, strong demand for veterans amongst uh, employers. People want to hire veterans. We did some, um, uh, some uh, survey work last year with uh, YouGov looking at public perceptions and the perceptions of employers. Um, and about 66% of employers said that they were really interested in having more UK ex-forces personnel in their businesses. Um, they wanted to know more about that and how to achieve that, but there was a really strong appetite. And certainly we know anecdotally from talking to people uh, in this room who kind of run CTP, for example, or the Forces Employment Charity, once a business hires some veterans and see what they can do, they want to hire more of them. So demand actually outstrips uh, supply at the moment. But as I said, it's not just about any job, it's about getting veterans the right job and making the best use of, uh, of that, um, that skill set for our economy. We know that veterans are often prized as much for their soft skills as they are for their technical skills. Um, you think you want somebody who's got particular skills in XYZ, but it turns out actually it's their leadership, it's their management, it's their ability to engage stakeholders um, that, that makes the big difference once they're in. Um, people have talked to me about their resilience, how effective veterans performed through uh, the COVID pandemic, for example, um, compared to other staff, their low sickness absence rates. Um, so we know that veterans make a really uh, fantastic employers. When I was in the States, uh, ooh, I think just over a year ago now, um, they had some really good data showing that veterans get promoted faster, that they tend to have higher salaries than their non-veteran uh, cohorts. So that suggests that obviously they, people do come in and make a really strong difference. So there's a really strong business case, which you probably already know. Um, what can you do if you're not already uh, sort of doing it? And we know the vast majority of veterans transition uh, perfectly successfully. They, they are a small minority who do need support and a core part of what we do in the Office of Veterans Affairs with others across government is to make sure that there is that support for men mental health, housing, um, transition and so on. Um, so veterans don't really need handouts, they don't need sort of pity jobs, but it doesn't mean that there isn't anything that you can do to support uh, transition, because you can play a role in making that transition as successful as possible. Um, and we know from talking to businesses that veterans and military programmes really can make a difference. Having a targeted, dedicated effort to, um, whether that's recruitment and training schemes, mentoring schemes, bespoke transition support, um, Veterans often have difficulty translating their skills still, making their CVs relevant, believing in themselves, talking about themselves. You know, I've kind of per seen, personally seen that in trying to hire veterans into the Office of Veterans Affairs. Um, still, people like to talk about what their team did and what, they, what we did, and it, it just doesn't necessarily translate as well uh, compared to other people. So recognising that, building that in, accommodating that, because you know you want to bring in veterans uh, can, can be really helpful. Um, as an example, in, the, in uh, the civil service, we've rolled out a great place to work scheme. This is um, a guaranteed progression scheme. People normally, uh, an interview is the first stage, but not always. If a veteran meets the minimum criteria for the job, they are guaranteed to get over that first hurdle. We know that that's led to almost 1,000 veterans getting into the civil service under that scheme, joining the approximately 17,000 or more civil, uh, veterans or civil servants that we, that we already have. So it's, it's making a difference, but we're looking to see what more we can do to further support and strengthen into um, into the civil service, just like we've got other schemes like Step Into Health in the, in the health service, which again is like a targeted support scheme for helping people make the, the transition from military to um, NHS service. If you know you've got veterans in your organisation, encourage them to um, build a veteran or an armed forces network. Helen's already said veterans uh, support each other really well, and, and again, I've seen this sort of firsthand within the civil service. If you give veterans an opportunity to support each other and give each other peer support and mutual aid, they will absolutely help and raise each other up and strengthen uh, their contribution. 
Um, see so what you can do to count your veterans. Data is really important. Can you, do you know how many veterans um, or indeed reservists are working in your organisation? Once you've got that picture, you can then um, uh, sort of delve into it and understand sort of how are they performing? What value are they adding? How do, that how do they compare to non-veteran employers? There's some really good private sector sort of exemplars in this. I want to call out sort of Amazon and Barclays as the people who I know are doing this and doing it well. We are not yet doing it well in the civil service, and that's something that we continue to work on, but I, I absolutely not think that if you've got a good base of data and evidence, then that gives you um, the sort of information you need to, to further improve. Continue to demonstrate your commitment to the armed forces. Helen mentioned there are people in this room who haven't yet signed the covenant. You know, why not? Because we know that there are 9,000 people who have. There are 640, I think, unless that's not quite the most up to date. <coughs> but there's over 600 sort of gold uh, award uh, employers. If you have signed the covenant, if you are already sort of in that basket, what are you doing to spread that sort of good practice amongst your supply chains, with your business partners, with the people that you work with, so that you're kind of properly advocating right across the sector for the armed forces community? And then, you know, be as, as bold and as visible and as loud as you can in celebrating your success about telling us about what you've done so that we can amplify it and we can highlight your best practice and give you good credit and show other people um, how it can be done. And again, finally, just to reiterate Helen's point, think about how we can make this work for every veteran. We know that there are some cohorts of veterans that face more barriers, women, LGBT veterans, wounded, injured and sick, the over 50s, early service leavers, their employment record isn't as strong. How do we address that? How do we make sure that we're not just providing something that works for the, for the majority, but that works for, for everybody, all of whom kind of got some um, fantastic uh, sort of value to contribute? Um, so to finish, how will we in the government help you to do all of this? Because that is quite a big ask, and we want to make it as easy and as, as successful for you as possible. Um, we will arm our veterans as best as we can, ready for the world of work. Um, the MOD will, will, will talk you know, at great length about the uh, CTP contract and the great support that they offer to people leaving. We have worked with the DWP to make sure that there are armed forces uh, champions in every job centre so that they can provide sort of tailored support. We work closely with the forces employment charity. So we will try and make sure that veterans are as ready as possible when they leave. We will try and incentivise business where we can. So we've introduced a national insurance uh, holiday for if the first year of employing somebody in their first civilian job. If there are other things that we can do that can make a difference, you know, do tell us because we are in the market for, you know, what more we can do to, to like I say, make, make best use of, of our veteran uh, cohort. And we absolutely, we will listen to your ideas because you know what business needs, you know how business works, you know what makes a difference in terms of helping support and enable veterans to support uh, UK business and, and economy. So um, we have an, a veteran employers group that we've set up with people who are doing this well, are ready to share ideas and give us feedback. If you're not on that group, that doesn't mean you can't contribute, that doesn't mean you can't have a dialogue with us. And so don't hesitate to tell us what you think we should be doing and we will listen. And we will try and capture and share your best practice, your ideas, um, your successes, so that we can learn from each other and, and support each other and really kind of champion where there are good things uh, happening. So we know that veterans are kind of one of the most kind of sound investments that any business can make, whether that's kind of the small and medium-sized enterprises that are the backbone of our economy or sort of leading um, FTSE 100 companies that are sort of leaders in their field. Whether you're hiring one veteran or 100 or 1,000 veterans, I absolutely guarantee that there will be a positive benefit on your business. Um, I would just ask, uh, fi finish by asking all of you to think about what more you can do. How do we work better together? How do we um, take this kind of effort on sort of veteran employment to the next sort of level? Find me, find Jonathan from my team, get in touch with the OVA outside of today to talk about how we can learn from each other, how we can better support you, and so that we can sort of drive out what I hope is a shared ambition to do the best for sort of UK economy, UK business, and our UK veterans. Um, thank you very much. I will now invite Brigadier Lamb to come up and talk about cadets. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Anthony Lamb's my name. I'm the, uh, the head of Youth and Cadets in the MOD. I'm not the head of anything in so far as um, each of the single services has their own cadet forces um, that, uh, that are led by their one-star equivalents. And, and I sit in MOD and are responsible for the policy and the strategic direction of that organisation. Um, I'm an Army Reservist by, um, um, by 
uh, inclination. I'm a, I'm a deputy headmaster in a school by trade. Uh, I'm sorry I wasn't here this morning. Um, I was actually teaching my year 11 geography set um, at 8.30 this morning uh, and then jumped on a train to come up. So I haven't had a chance to meet as many of you as I would like, but I am going to be around later on. But on the theme of teaching, and I'm just watching the, bank, the back row as I would straight after lunch in my class, <laughs> so just seeing if there's nodding heads. Um, but I just wonder if, a quick show of hands, please, if you could, if you think, if you know what the um, the letters C F A V stand for. Thank you very much. Um, pay attention because by the end of this short presentation, I'm going to ask the same question again, and I'd expect all the hands to uh, to rise. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the cadet forces, and I'm going to focus on one aspect of the cadet forces in particular, um, but. We're all aware of the cadets as a wonderful MOD-sponsored youth movement um, in, uh, in the UK. You may or may not be aware of the scale of this. Um, there are about 130,000 young people between the age of 19, uh, 9 and 18 um, who make up or who are members of one of the five cadet force organisations out there. And there are, are also nearly 30,000 adult volunteers. Well, there's two letters, AV, as part of this that make up the, uh, the cadet forces. And as you can see there, there are a number of different types of cadet force organisations. The Army Cadet Force, the Air Training Corps and the Combined Cadet Force um, and the Volunteer Cadet Force are more closely aligned and linked to the MOD. The, the Sea Cadet Corps is a charity that is linked to the MOD through a memorandum of understanding with the, with the Royal Navy. But the fact is, these numbers are fat. There's a lot of young people engaged in cadets and there's a lot of adult volunteers. What I think is also increasingly understood is the value that the cadet forces give in terms of how they develop young people and prepare them to be world ready. And I think it's probably common knowledge out there that those young, you know, those 13 to 18 year olds in particular, and particularly when you meet some of those 17 and 18 year olds who stand in front of you and speak, they are impressive young people. The University, the University of Northampton uh, undertook a research study as opposed to an e-search study um, that, um, that looked at the sort of the attributes that young people get from their cadet experience. And I hasten to point out that cadets is not the only organisation that develop young people. You know, we don't have the rights or, uh, um, to that, but we do understand what it does for the young people who are engaged. And this concept of self-efficacy is a concept that's not um, fully known by many people. It is all about a young person's ability to control and to control the environment and feel that they are in control of their environment that they find themselves in, whether that be um, their family environment. And let's be honest, there are some very tricky family environments out there, whether it is in education and the way they get on with their young peers um, at school or just when they're out and about. And, and what has been shown is that the cadet experience does improve a young person's self-efficacy. And with that, things like educational outcomes. If you're a confident young person, you're more willing to engage with the education that has been put in front of you. you know, truancy levels come down. Improved physical and mental well-being. The enhanced employability that comes with developing all those wonderful soft skills that they get. And I know you know more about soft skills because you're looking for more than just the, the A-levels, the BTECs, the GCSEs, there's far more to a young person than that. Those BTECs and A-levels and GCSEs may get them an interview, but it is those soft skills that are going to land them the job when they're in that room with 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 other people. So we know and understand the value that the cadet experience does bring. I know that the hot topic out there is, well, you know, how do we access this young talent pool? And, and many of you in your, you know, are keen to engage with the cadet space and sort of have access to that talent pool. And we, we do understand that as well. And this is a, a nascent sort of direction of travel because we owe it to the young people to protect them, the adult volunteers to protect them, the communities who've entrusted those young people to us to protect them. Um, but at the same time, we want to give them the opportunities as well. And, and I know that there are many sort of local initiatives and local connections out there that are being made with local cadet units to sort of to, to share those opportunities with those young people. 
And the only caveat I sort of present to you is that we just have to do it in a very measured and balanced way. Um, but that, as I said, is the beginnings of a longer narrative and dialogue. But we welcome sort of engagement and support from, from business and organisations in that space. What I want to spoke, speak about are these Cadet Force adult volunteers, these CFAVs, gusting 30,000 of them. And these come from all sorts of backgrounds. They're not all, contrary to popular belief, former members of the regular reserve forces. There is a significant number of adult volunteers who have never been near a uniform, but they bring a wonderful skill set and an approach to working with young people. They come from all backgrounds and communities. They are great role models. They are not part of the armed forces. They wear the uniform of the armed forces. They are not part of the armed forces. They derive benefits from working with young people. They derive skills and qualifications through the cadet forces as well that actually enhance the skills that they have that they can in turn bring back to their employment as well. They give up one or two evenings a week. They are not paid on a daily basis for doing that. They give up their weekends, typically one or more a month. They spend four or five days away at a time on residential camps and courses. And sometimes they take that time out of their annual leave allocation from their employers. Sometimes they, what I would call, steal time. In other words, they finish work at six o'clock and when everybody goes home and has their supper, it is these characters that jump in a vehicle and drive to a local cadet detachment location, whether it be Army, Navy or Air Force, and spend another two hours working with these young people. So they are a wonderful resource that can also bring benefit back to those employers that support them based on the skills that they get from them giving the cadet experience. And the reality is behind every smiling and engaged young person, there is an adult volunteer. So what I really want to talk to you briefly about is what you can do to support them. Understand what they do. First of all, understand if you have any of them in your employ. Be aware that they can bring additional skills to your workplace that they in turn derive from the satisfaction they get from working with young people, but also some of those skills they derive um, from the, the abundant courses that are out there for their own personal development as well. And give them space and recognition to enable them to engage with those 130,000 young people who frankly, if they weren't doing the cadet experience, who knows what they would be doing and who knows what they miss out on in their attempts to derive something as an alternative. So ladies and gentlemen, that's the end of my pitch today, but before I go, it'd only be right for me to report back to my headmaster on my ability to teach. Can I now have a show of hands if you understand what the words CFAV stand for? <laughs> Thank you very much. Can I invite the uh, panel to come and take a seat? And I'm just going to ask you to introduce yourselves and then we'll take some questions from Slido and we'll take some questions from the audience. I think we've got about 20 minutes. Um, so, Jenna. Yeah. Um, hi, I'm Jenna Clare and I'm head of the Armed Forces Covenant team in the Ministry of Defence, working very closely with Helen. Thanks, Jenna. And Chloe? I'm Chloe Mackay. I'm the Deputy Chief Executive of the Forces Employment Charity. Thanks, Chloe. James? Hi, so I'm James Cameron. I run a service charity, but I run... Um, I think called Mission Automotive into the automotive industry, and I think called Mission Renewable into the renewable sector on behalf of the respective industry bodies, and we're a gold award holder. Uh, thanks, Helen. Good to appear, everybody. Uh, Jonathan Smith, I'm at the Office for Veterans Affairs in Cabinet Office alongside Jesse. Um, I'm one of our policy leads on employment, and I also look after our governance and boards, such as the Veterans Advisory Board and the Veterans Employers Group that Jesse had mentioned earlier. Brilliant. So they're all prized to take your questions. Is Slider going to appear on the... There for me. Okay. I'm trying to think of the ones that we haven't answered already. Um, okay, let's, get, let's go from the top. 
Um, the first one from Izzy, um, and just to read out loud for those that are joining online, please can you expand on how you support reservists who get better civilian employer support when taking time for maternity family responsibilities? Is Izzy in the audience? No, okay, on Slido. Does anybody want to, or does anybody from the reserve team want to come and tackle that one? Um, Shall I take one first? Yeah, go for yeah. it. Um, so I'd say obviously reservists are part of the Armed Forces Covenants as much as any other part of the Armed Forces community. Um, the Armed Forces Covenant is about every single part of what makes defence happen, and that is regulars, reserves, veterans and service families. Um, one thing I'd say about the Covenant, it came in in 2010, as Helen alluded to, as a really key manifesto commitment for what was then the Coalition Government, and it's continued to be a commitment right through the present day, and actually... Certainly, I'm not saying going forward into the future, but I will say that Labour is certainly a very um, assiduous supporter of the Covenant. One thing we're always looking at doing, however, is not resting on, on our laurels and looking at where disadvantage arises due to service. And if, for example, we are finding that due to the changing nature of civilian employment, our reservists are having issues in, in any respect, we, we're, we're almost there to search out and destroy and find that disadvantage and eradicate it, whether that's by what we mostly do, which is working with other government departments, with civilian employers such as yourselves, um, and particularly with colleagues in the charitable sector such as Chloe. Um, it's an ongoing piece. So certainly in terms of this, um, that's a really important issue. Um, Izzy, I would love to get in contact with you. Um, please sort of reach out to my team. We have a, a website, armedforcescovenant.gov.uk. Um, but what we try to do, we try to identify these issues. If you're aware of them, let us know. We are not psychic, but we do, we do our best. But tell us, and we can try and sort it out. But thank you for raising it. Really important issue. Thank you very much, uh, Jenna, and thanks, Izzy, for your question. Um, one here from Canon Peter. Uh, should cadets now be part of the Armed Forces Covenant, especially as many of them are service children? Um, so my kind of take on this, and we have looked at it, previously is that the Armed Forces Covenant is there because of the mobility requirement and the requirement to serve overseas in dangerous places, do dangerous things that our armed forces do, and that's not what we ask of our cadets. So the areas of disadvantage and looking after people for special provision is because of the armed forces nature of what we ask our people to do and the mobility and separation requirements they have. Um, cadets, as Anthony said, really important part of our wider ecosystem and there are other ways that I think that we need to um, make sure that we are looking after service children, enabling them to fulfil their potential, whether that's through the service people premium, where it's things that we do in the family strategy, which is available on .gov.uk, or things through the Armed Forces Family um, Fund Trust, etc. So really important to recognise cadets as our um, as part of the ecosystem, but I don't think they face the same disadvantage, obligations and sacrifices that our armed forces, uh, operational armed forces community do. Um, we've got another one here um, from David Green. Are you able to provide an update around the rollout of veterans' ID cards to verify access to goods and services open to service leavers? Jesse? Yeah, I'm uh, really happy to give an update. So we will start to issue ID cards to people who served before 2018 this year. So the Office of Veterans Affairs has been working really closely with the Ministry of Defence and uh, Government Digital Service to put in place a mechanism for doing this, whereby we can very quickly and easily, via a digital application, verify that somebody is who they say they are, verify with MOD that they have served, issue them with a card and a digital form of verification as well. Um, obviously, you can imagine this is knitting together lots of different bits of uh, government systems, so it's taking a bit of time, but we're really confident that we'll be issuing, starting to issue cards this year it won't get round to issuing all two million of those cards. It will also be an application process. People will have to request them. But we anticipate later this year we'll get those first cards out of the door. In fact, you might have spotted that Johnny Mercer has uh, offered to shave his eyebrows off if he doesn't manage to start issuing uh, ID cards on, on some kind of Twitter uh, promise, which I thought was a bit bold. But, you know, um, it, it's a slight incentive for us to slow down the programme. But I still think that we are going to start issuing ID cards this year. Uh, I think they get shaved off for him, is actually how oh, it Oh, he shaved off for him? Yeah, no, it's, you don't get to do your own. Someone <laughs> does it for you. Are you volunteering? If necessary. <laughs> OK. <laughs> um, Chloe, perhaps you could um, answer the best practice on how to attract and engage with families, spouses, partners, children, serving personnel as an employer and challenges and opportunities? 
Um, absolutely. So there are sort of two key routes um, to engage with. There's Forces Families Jobs, who run a jobs board that is available and it goes through to the um, families, partners and spouses. There's also us, the Forces Employment Charity. We run a programme um, working to reach um, partners of serving military and partners of veterans to support them into employment. So to, we work together to support those family members into employment. And um, I think as an employer, um, when you've connected to families and you are looking to employ them, I think it's just being conscious of the fact that people may have gaps on their CV, people may have large numbers of jobs on their CV because they've had to move frequently, and just being aware of that and understanding that that group does have some absolutely fantastic skills because, of course, they haven't served in the military. Often their skills are, and education are very diverse, so a, a huge group to engage with to get into employment. Thank you. James, do you want to come up? I mean, I, that's absolutely the bedrock of what you can do. And I think there's lots of imaginative things that you can do over and above that as well. So some of the companies we, we have dealt with have done everything from presenting partner to the Invictus Games. You know, if you really want to raise your profile, um, I, that's an opportunity that's available to everybody. But for those who've got sensible, not very deep pockets, um, it depends what you're going for. There are so many opportunities, whether it's sponsoring bits of activity of service sport to... Um, reaching into geographic particular areas to establish links where you can just get involved with the armed forces community by supporting all of the things which are done in order to, uh, 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 to help them come together as a community because a lot of this is about employer brand PR. If people know that you're very forces friendly and of course the covenant is a wonderful way of showcasing that, making noise around that, then they're much more likely to come to you um, and have the confidence to be able to approach you because we often find that, you know, because of those backgrounds, where a CV's been unsuccessful in the past, it might put people off from then presenting it for jobs which are well within their capabilities to do. And you can help that by promoting and presenting yourself as an advocate for exactly these sort of behaviours, which is exactly what the ERS scheme looks for people to do. Thanks, James. James, I was going to ask you the question that was just up on here about engaging smaller businesses. I know the question mm. I asked that of government, but... With you with Mission Motorsport and Mission Renewables, what, as, as you as a business, what have you done to encourage smaller organisations to get behind you? What can other big organisations in the audience learn? So, I mean, I, I sat within, you know, sort of automotive sphere. It's very easy to sort of look at Jaguar Land Rover and go, gosh, isn't that impressive? You know, what a lot of people they've done. Um, but uh, for the smaller companies that sit in that space, who just look at it and go, well, we can't do that. Um, harness them. That ERS scheme, which sits behind the Covenant, bronze, silver, gold, I mean, clearly, if you're hitting silver, you do lots of things for the armed forces community. You're able to evidence it. The really key thing about gold is advocacy. And it doesn't end when somebody becomes gold. That's not it. You don't sit on your, you don't sit on your laurels at that point. You need to be looking for further opportunities for advocacy, which means helping others to follow the same path which you've done. So what that means for the small businesses, these biggies are opportunities to you. Any way that you can reach out and access a bit of support from Barclays to be able to cut some corners or to avoid some obvious mistakes from them, uh, they should be looking for opportunities to do that. And you do, see, you do see the gold and the Gold Award Association leaning into stuff like that. Our work in automotive is done through the industry body. So in the Society of Motor Manufacturers and Traders is the industry body for the automotive industry. There are 750 members are supported in doing armed forces engagement through their industry body. So there are actual resources there that they can call upon. And the same for Renewable UK across this huge burgeoning green sector. There are central resources that they can call upon, regardless of the size of company, in order to get some support in doing it. And of course, the other way you can do it is by reaching in through the mechanisms that the Covenant uses, whether that's regionally through the REEDs, or if you're lucky enough to be centrally and dealing directly with defence relationship management, they will have companies who are looking for opportunities to help others. Jump on board with that, use their help, and it just makes your life an awful lot easier on the way. Thank you, James. I'm going to come to the audience, and then I'll ask Jenna to answer the top question, and perhaps Jonathan, the, the middle one. Um, but any questions from the audience? Do you want to just introduce yourself um, <coughs> as you introduce your question for me? Hi, my name's Dan Wilkinson. I work for a small company called Hire a Veteran. 
which we've just rebranded to last week. What, what do you do, Dan? Yeah, thanks, Tony. <laughs> nice to see you, 20 years on. Uh, a question about the Armed Forces Covenant that I saw something on LinkedIn recently about where someone questioned a company using the Armed Forces Covenant that was signed, I don't know how many years ago, mm. which has effectively lapsed because the person who drove that within the company may have moved on. The employer's recognition scheme is audited, um, and I'm not sure what the time frame is, I think it's three or five years, they go in and check, make sure that you're still achieving your bronze, silver, gold levels. But we have no audit process, I don't think, for the Armed Forces Covenant. And, and we run the risk of people masquerading as forces-friendly employers when, realistically, that ship sailed five years ago. Are there any thoughts on that uh, as to whether that's uh, a sensible thing to try and do? Obviously, it requires resource. Um, I think it would be a good thing, personally. Janet, should I come to you for that? Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you. Really, really important question. Um, so I'm head of the Armed Forces Covenant team in MOD, so we run the policy. I work incredibly closely with Jacko and his um, amazing team over defence relationship management for, to, to do precisely that. Um, the Covenant's been going now since 2010, and there are a lot of people who are absolutely right, Rose, driven by a certain individual. And particularly for the smaller employers, it might well have been that they're not quite as assiduous as they once were in their pro-armed forces community standpoint. <coughs> what we rely on there is the fact that with the Covenant, we, when we called it the Covenant, is a very deliberate word. We don't call it a contract. We don't call it a deal. There's none of that legalistic piece. It's a... It's a <laughs> I always feel like high priestess is some sort of cult because it comes from the heart. Um, it's incredible, yeah, exactly. Is that kind of Peter? Hello. Yeah, it is religious. Um, it's an incredibly important piece that it's something where, and bearing in mind the context in 2010, I was out in Afghanistan myself in 2010, and I was helping to put many of the young men and women in boxes back on planes back to the UK, which we all saw. At the moment, thank God, we're not generating large numbers of those, but we never know when the next one's going to strike. I completely agree with your analysis that there are some companies where they are not doing what they could do right now for defence, for the defence community, I should say. I would say that that's kind of, it's not okay, because obviously you want them to do more. And that's why we have the ERS scheme, which works incredibly well. But it's almost the fact that, they've, that it's still there. And even if they're not doing anything, if they're actually acting against defence, obviously we're going to go, go in and... Sort, sort that out. And it's certainly something that Jacko and I and other colleagues in MOD head office discuss frequently in terms of what we do about those who renege on their, on their pledges. Um, we have weapons, sadly not allowed to use them in that respect, but it's that sort of thing. But I would say that certainly Jacko and his team work very closely, and bearing in mind every single member of the, every single signatory to the Armed Forces Covenant is somewhere on the ERS scheme. You know, everyone starts at bronze, they build up to silver and gold. Um, and so we do keep checking, but it's not an audit piece. We can't hold them to account. There's not a contract. It's not that you've, 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 you've backed out on it, we're therefore going to get you. Um, we try to appeal to the heart, and that's so important, and that's why we don't go after people in that way. We could do, but we don't want to put off people from joining, because it is, as I said, and I can't have said enough, it is this a thing which people... It's not something you sign with your head. When you sign as a CEO, you don't get your chief financial officer, your chief legal officer. You do it because you want to, because you want to help that community. Um, so it's quite important that we don't. It's probably not answering your question probably quite where you wanted, but I hope it is true. <coughs> Thanks, Jenna. So certainly some self-policing and as a community holding to each other to account, I think. There were some more hands that went up earlier. There's a um, gentleman at the back and then the lady in the middle. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Edward. I'm currently a um, uh, SO3 plans officer in the defence people team. Uh, so my question is, the best OC I ever had told me that resettlement from the forces starts on your first day in uniform. Is work being done by the Armed Forces Covenant and the Office for Veteran Affairs to engage with service people whilst they are still serving by offering work placements and industry insights to lay the foundations for their civilian life? Or is the focus for the AFC and the OVA exclusively on those who are leaving or have left the services? That's um, yeah, great question. And I think that plays into what we were hearing earlier about skills and about lateral entry and about that spectrum of service, because those industry placements should be happening throughout your 
career. Of course, we've also brought in the tri-service transition policy, which is much more holistic, the JSP 100, which you might be familiar with, which is through career and looks at all aspects of transition, not just employment transition. But I think that's where it's really important that we look at through career and that um, contract that we have as society, people coming in and out, the lateral entry point, so that when you transition finally from the armed forces, it's not such a, a big jump. Um, but Jonathan, there was a similar question here um, on on how we work collaboratively to ensure that kind of really smooth handover together and whether it is not just veterans but people still in service. Yeah, um, it's a great question and I think, you know, not to, to reframe it um, as, as maybe my traditional way, but OVA, MOD and everybody in this room and a lot of people who aren't. So we'd mentioned earlier today thinking about SMEs, small and medium-sized enterprises that are spread across the country, of learning some of that best practice from the leaders in each of the sectors. We've mentioned some of them um, already today and how that can be exported. Some of those cohorts of minority groups of individuals who at some points have felt left behind or the messaging that we collectively share for some reason may not be to them and working to involve them into these opportunities. So it's making people aware, I think, of what's available, but also a moment of convincing. And I was really interested um, the gentleman in the audience's question, you'd mentioned that when someone had spoken to you, any veteran that I've known without fail or even a reservist who has chosen to go back in or indeed to go in for the first time later in the career, there's always been a conversation where someone has said, do you realize the potential that you have? Something about this humbleness, this self-effacing mindset um, that I've been terrible for throughout my career as well of, let me tell you about what the team did instead of what I did. And that conversation piece about here is how your skills are transferable. So I think, you know, in short, it is MOD and OVA working closely together. I think personally that relationship is good. I would go as far as to say perhaps the best it's ever been, that we have this shared mission, this shared focus, and agreed upon objective, if you will. Jesse had mentioned earlier that from the recent um, Career Transition Partnership report, a record high of veterans' employment, 87%. Now, how do we think about value employment? Now, how do we think about some of those groups that have felt left behind or not engaged with employers, with the employers who aren't in the room? So there's a lot that we can do, those of us who are here, but we are already here. My answer, therefore, to this would be the next step is that we go out into society at large with those SMEs, with those individuals who are in geographically diverse areas outside of the barracks or the base or the port or the veteran retirement town, as the case may be. Some of the heat maps from the survey that we have and the census shows us where that is. But really, it's again, all of us here making those links together and showing where there's an incentive in it for everybody to take part. So MOD and OVA at the core, all of us together reaching out and bringing people in, I think, is the next step and how we get from volume simply into also value. Thanks very much, Jonathan and Chloe. Yeah, I would, I would just like to talk a bit about mentoring. I think one of the practical things that employers can do to support um, people who are serving and also those who have left is, is to provide mentoring. So it's a very useful way for people that are serving and the veterans to understand what actually happens in a job and understand how to navigate the recruitment process for that particular industry. And the employers that we work with are incredibly keen to um, open up mentoring opportunities for their staff. So a lot have uh, two-day volunteering opportunities for staff. And those mentor uh, relationships with serving personnel and veterans are hugely valuable to starting to think about transition earlier. Thanks, Chloe. And there was a lady just halfway down, if you want, if you've got the mic there. Perfect. Yes. Hi, uh, my name is Michelle McKernan. and I'm a head of engagement at Highland RFCA, uh, and I'm one of 13 heads of engagement uh, at the RFCA to deliver the Armed Forces Covenant and the Bronze, Gold, uh, Silver and Gold Awards. Um, we've heard today how much value rightly is placed on the Armed Forces Covenant and what it delivers, uh, and it has become uh, a victim of its own catastrophic success, I think it, it is true to say, and the gentleman, <coughs> excuse me, the gentleman uh, earlier you know, brought up the point about how we audit it, how we manage it, how we keep control of it. It is growing 
year on year on year on year. Um, in, in my patch in Highland, I have 20,000 square miles to cover with employers from um, Shetland, you know, down to the Central Belt. And I have two reads um, as part of Jacko's team. And I can I can hear Jacko getting hot and horrible and wincing and thinking, where is she going with this? Um, but uh, I'm, uh, you know, my fellow heads of engagement will agree. We we cannot keep. Um, doing more with less, and we cannot keep delivering this wonderful program that delivers so many benefits to cadets, to reservists, to CFAFs, on less and less and less every year. It's just a point that I wanted to raise. How do we manage this going forward? And if the Ministry of Defence values it as it says it does, how is it going to resource it so we can continue to do the job? Thank you. Thank you. Great question, and I think sustainability has got to be around training the trainers. And you know, there's lots of toolkits up on the websites. There's lots of pace best practice guides. Uh, there's just a whole wealth of information out there. We need to get other people delivering on our behalf. We need to empower and equip people to be able to deliver the confidence. It's not just dependent on your two reads. It's dependent on all of us and our supply chains and all the people that we come into contact with. So it shouldn't be the armed forces champions just delivering this. It needs to be a whole of nation, whole of society. And the more that we can talk. About it, the easier that we can make it for people by spreading that best practice and using the toolkits. There are so many available. Um, that's, I think, how we're going to get um, to get through that. But thank you. It is it is a challenge, and thank you for the, all that you're doing with limited resource. It's always um, the bane of, of my challenge as well in the directorate. Uh, resource is always is always the problem. You could always do more with more. So you've got to do the best with what you've got. And I think that is about you know sh sharing those tools and getting empowering others to to help deliver with us as well. How am I doing for time? I kind of write on time, aren't I? All right. Okay, brilliant. I will then. Um, so there was one, there was one here which we continue to get asked, and it's jumped now actually. But I'm just going to uh, remember it anyway. It was about um, it's about government departments signing up to the covenant. This has been quite controversial, and we get lots of questions about it. I'll pick the easy bit, which is all government departments have signed up to the covenant. It's a government commitment that all government departments have to uh, work towards, and we have a a cross-government forum where we talk about all of the kinds of things that each government department is held to account with. You can find all the things that we're doing across government in the annual Covenant and Veterans Report, which you can get on .gov.uk. But the question was also about non-ministerial departments. So I've seen that's like our arms, dense bodies, and our non-departmental public bodies, of which there are hundreds. Jenna, I thought that they could all sign up to the Covenant, because they're not... They're like it's a government department, I are all signed up, but <laughs> what's your view? I apologise for my answer. I'm a civil servant. I'm going to dissect it. Um, it depends which, which sort they are. If they're non-ministerial departments, such as, for example, Her Majesty, His Majesty's, sorry, Revenue and Customs, um, they are part, a central government department. They are actually signed up to it already. Um, NDPBs, non-departmental public bodies, can sign up to it. Please do. Thank you very much. And can I just say, I didn't actually plant that last question, but I <laughs> would love a bit more resource. Thank you. <laughs> so. um, Anthony, a question for you, please. How can an employer connect with the cadets to advertise apprenticeships? And, and as I touched on earlier, this, this is a growing area of interest, and, and, and why not? You know, we've got this wonderful talent pool of young people out there, 13 to 18. And, and I caveat, as I said, it, it's balancing the, the finite time we've got with young people um, to deliver the cadet experience and not moving into that area of taking on the role of schools or being a job centre and all the rest of it. But having said all of that, um, you know, it is very much a bottom-up approach um, with, with a number of local initiatives and local connections being made through the RFCAs. And so I'd encourage you to connect with your RFCAs who will have the ins into the local area cadet force organisations. Um, there have been some early initiatives. Um, there's a job fair up in, up in the Midlands, which wasn't particularly targeted at cadets, but cadets were invited along. And, and again, you know, on a no sort of, um, a no holds barred sort of arrangement, you know, they could if they wished, um, but there is no single clearinghouse. But I would say that this is early days in this whole sort of exploring the, the, the so what's from having this wonderful talent pool and there'll be more on this over time. Thank you, Anthony. And I'll follow up then with this next question. Can you say a bit more about the benefits to employers of staff who are cadet force adult volunteers what transferable qualifications can they achieve? There's some examples there, but do you want to... Uh, absolutely, and, um, and I mean, that question is a good one for me to take away as well, because the fact that it's not well known out there is, is an area of work that we can, we can do at our end. But, you know, from the sublime to, the, to sort of the ridiculous, from, you know, the Institute of Leadership Management, um, adult volunteers through the Cadet Vocational Qualifications Organisation can get ILM Level 7, 
you know, they can go up to effectively a degree and master's level in leadership and management um, if they so wish to take that opportunity. But coming right back down to the grassroots, the fact that these individuals turn up on an evening and they're instructing young people, they're helping to solve some pretty challenging problems is the reality that sometimes these young people bring their problems with them. Um, you know, by way of example, um, you know, safeguarding is a, is a key tenant in what we do in the cadet space. 20% of the safeguarding issues that we are dealing with through the cadet organisations are issues that have been brought to us from home. They're nothing to do with engage safeguarding issues to do um, with cadets or, 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 or peer on peer. So these adults are dealing with those sort of issues. They're thinking on their feet. Um, so we've got the instructional confidence, um, organisational skills that they get from switching off from their day's work to come home and take on a totally different set of skills, planning and implementing activities and exercises for young people, um, as well as the first aid courses and all the myriad of other courses that they can go off to develop themselves as adult volunteer leaders within the cadet space. And, and to be a commissioned officer within the cadet forces, in whatever guise that may be, is a selection process and then it is followed by a mentoring and a training process as well. So what we're providing for society is, is effectively leadership development as well. Um, and if I could just say, just because we employ a couple of them, um, and one of them was an existing one when they came and worked for us, and the other one has volunteered and has gone through the process, we as an employer see the benefits from that with, with the, uh, the work which they do against all, all sorts of things, but it includes safeguarding and a whole host of other stuff that's about dealing with, with children that for some of the other parts of our work is incredibly useful. And so we directly benefit as an employer. Thank you very much, Dave. Um, James, Steve, Kate, Katie, I'm sorry, I'm not gonna to get to your questions, but we'll do that um, post the conference. I think we can uh, write up responses to the Slido, but there was a question on there, which is about how is it best to contact the Veterans Office of Veterans Affairs? You've got a functional mailbox, haven't you? Yeah, you have, it's um, veterans at cabinetoffice.gov.uk. If you can't remember that, you can find me on LinkedIn and send me a message and I'll read you through. Um, if you know James Cameron, if you know Helen, if you know Jacko, you can always uh, help them get in touch with us. Um, there's a rep from the Federation of Small Businesses, uh, Ren Kapoor, who sits on the Veterans Employers Group. You will probably know somebody who knows how to get in touch with us if you forget that email address. But to remind you, it's veterans at cabinetoffice.gov.uk. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you very much, panel. Huge thank you for being here. Jacko, back to you. Thanks very much, panel. Um, some interesting questions, and exactly as, um, and as Helen has said, we will endeavour to, uh, well, we won't endeavour to, we will roll through those questions and get answers um, out as part of the pre-conference material. Um, that's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, we are going to invite a couple of people back to the stage, I think, General, or are you... Uh, Helen, do you want to come back as well? Eldon, get one up. All right, targets will fall when hit. <laughs> I've brought my three, amigo the three amigos, there we go. Right, what do we think? Useful? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's that time of the afternoon, isn't it? Everyone's going, I want to get out of here. Right, we've got the three people on the stage that um, are pulled together uh, today. And I, I thought, you know, my, my observations um, are, and, and I'll ask the other two in a second what they, they think we've got out of it. But, you know, this is much more of a, a, a defence people event um, and partnering with defence, not just about reserve stuff or, um, you know, sort of a, a particular area of the, um, of, of the covenant or what have you. This is the whole piece. And I love the ha having the OVA in, uh, in the conversation. And the cadet. So we've got the cadet piece, a Anthony, the start of life. We've got the service bit and then we've got the veterans bit. And um, understanding that, uh, that journey, that path, and, and how, as um, Admiral Anthony mentioned earlier, the zigzag career, how things are changing. Um, in today's world. So we talked about war for talent, we talked about a covenant, we talked about reserve service. So that sort of, I think, gave a very rich perspective on the things that are going on. We're worrying in defence people. And it's all down to partnering. It's all going to be a much closer, more integrated conversation with employers, with society, with other government departments. I think if that's come out, then I think we've slightly achieved our aim. And I'm also very keen that we listen. Uh, it's a two-way conversation. We have, as a, a defence organisation, we spend a lot of time talking to you. Um, I'm really keen to hear what you, know, what, what, what you think. 
and any points that you want to raise to us before we close the conference. What do you, Eldon, what do you, does that chime? Yes, definitely. So this is the first one of these that I have done, and I have found it incredibly um, beneficial. I think one of my observations, and I have been doing this job for about a year, just over a year now, and one of the real challenges, and one that has come out in almost every engagement that I've done with people this morning, is around you know some of our some of our sort of different elements of the workforce are quite stovepiped, and as we have done all of the work in terms of the next sort of bound of the of the defence people strategy, what is ever more clear, and of course we all know it, don't we? But we don't necessarily talk about it, is that we will be so reliant on a on a sort of blended um, workforce to, to to take us forward. And you know, one of the things that we're really focused on at the moment is that sort of continuum of service. As I highlighted uh, when we did questions, some 19 different types of employment already. But if you were to ask me um, how people bounce between those, move up and down that, it's much more difficult than it needs to be, and it's much more difficult than we need it to be in the next, in the next few years. So for me, this has been a really good opportunity. Um, if I'm honest, I wasn't necessarily sure what to expect, um, but the questions and the engagement has been incredibly helpful, and my pocket is bulging with cards and things to take away. So really, really useful. That's great. I think, Floor, voice back to the audience, really, to hear from you about what's working well, what's not working well, challenges back, and what more we can do to make this easier for you. Fantastic. Let's kick it off. We've got a mic. Ta -ta. <laughs> um, hello. Um, my name's Kat Cliff. I'm People and Sustainability Director at Octavius Infrastructure Company. Um, so I'm really conscious that we as an industry need to have recruits um, for, as part of our recruitment for workforce planning and fill the skills gap. And I think also we need certainty in that space. I think you need people available for, to be reservists and be available for being deployed. How do you think, a, how do you think we could utilise a secondment model between both parties so that there's some certainty for employers that they've got people for a certain amount of time, but you still get the reservists that you need? Yeah, so lots of people have spoken to me about secondment models and how, how we do that. And um, at the moment, there are, in the region, I think it's about 12 different interventions that we've got with various different types of secondment. Some long-term, some short-term, some in very focused areas. You know, there's a whole breadth of different ones. One of the things that we are doing in the sort of next bound of that work is to look and see how we, you know, how do we bring some more coherence to what that looks like. So you've sort of got these pop-up opportunities. There's also a question, and I think some people that I was, I was chatting to at lunch, um, there's really a question about making sure that we've got that triumvirate of benefit to the sort of the, the employer that they go to, benefit to the individual, and then benefit to the organisation they're coming from. Because ultimately, one of the pressures we've got is, you know, we haven't got lots of spare workforce, so it's how do we make sure that we're, we're sort of putting it into the right space. The work, though, that Zoe is going to take is, is now doing around that spectrum of service. I think that's one of the hooks that that, 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 that offers us to, to do. Because you could imagine a different category of service, um, not unlike, for example, my colleagues in Australia and things where you, know, you can flick from military service to civilian service to government service and then back again up that, up that sort of continuum quite quickly. I think that would be really um, positive. I think that would be really positive because I think it gives both sides of all, all areas of the triangle a bit of certainty because you know, we've got massive works of work bank that we need people for, but then to then lose somebody for a few weeks or a few months yeah. and then bring them back in is really different for, from a project management perspective. Yeah. So I think just thinking slightly differently and outside the box and actually understanding the needs, as you rightly said, of each the employer and the reservist is really going to reap benefits in the longer term. And it's a different way of managing it all, right? It is. Yeah. Yeah, really good question. I've got one here I'll take. How will we tailor future reserve recruitment to ensure the skills from industry are properly utilised? Well, I think part one is to work out what skills and capabilities we really want to get after and, and those, those ones that are difficult to train for and retain in a regular force. And I think, you know, understanding what those vertical, you know, centres of expertise are and then partnering with the relevant uh, businesses to, to do that and looking at how we can provide that through life uh, career um, 
is, is something that I think we can certainly get after. We're, we're getting you know, more advanced in our thinking about what those capabilities are. Um, we do start to target specialist skills, in particular cyber, uh, but there are many others that we want to get after. There are certain industries which you know, are quite small. The, the nuclear one is the one that uh, keeps coming on. You know, how, how can we work more uh, in partnership with, with that? And this, this audience here is very much employer engagement. There's a whole different audience discussing um, I, I, you know, industry and defense engagement. And, and you know, I'm hoping over time we start to join the two streams because I think there's mutual benefit. There's a question there from the audience. Hi, um, Steve Prouse, uh, Austin Elliott Consultancy. Uh, a small business, uh, is only four or five years old, a uh, significant number of ex-service personnel in it. Um, we are recruiting. Um, we enjoy recruiting ex-military personnel for uh, the reasons that have already uh, been uh, outlined, um, leadership, communication, all those sorts of things. But it also, there's also something else to it. It's it's, it's that nice, warm, fuzzy feeling as lots of ex-military personnel already in the company giving back, trying to help. So don't underestimate that sort of um, the, the feeling you get from the business community trying to, to help. Uh, just a comment on, on a, a point that was raised earlier. Um, from our experience, um, engaging with service leavers as early as possible um, benefits both us and the service leader lever. Um, we're quite lucky in the uh, the area that we uh, we work in in our location, uh, in that we have uh, service personnel who we we know and work with. Uh, so once we know of their intentions, um, we start having those conversations with them, and that doesn't only uh, happen because we are going to recruit them. It happens. Uh, early enough such that we're able to give them sort of guidance and advice, a bit of mentoring, and it doesn't matter if they join us. That, that again, that's just part of the, bait, the payback. So don't underestimate the importance of uh, that, having that relationship. And again, it all goes back to the Armed Forces Covenant. It's not just about what uh, military personnel, ex-military personnel can, uh, can give to the employer, um, what the employer uh, is able to do to, to help. It, it's, it's the wider context. It's not about just about recruiting them into the business. It's about helping them get into a career. Alan, do you want to comment? I, th I think, uh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely right. And I think this is perhaps something that Alden under the CTP, we're looking at bringing in employers earlier than, well, it's two years pre-discharge at the moment, isn't it? Two years pre-transition. So I think there's something in the formality of CTP, which is the relay that allows us an opportunity to do with that. One of the things that has become so apparent in that is just making sure that we've got the network that, that that can draw on in the right place. You know, there's a formal bit of who's providing training and so on and so forth, but there's an informal element to that as well. And part of that is what we're all doing today, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's making sure we're in that space. The second bit is, is, is giving some, you know, is giving some prominence to, as you say, those less formal networks of veterans who, who are out there at the moment. You know, one of the things that I've got involved with recently is City Veterans, which has a particular focus on the financial sector in, in London, for example. And there are any number of those kind of initiatives dotted around. But how can we advocate for that? How can we give greater prominence to, to, what, that's, um, to what that's worth? So I'm going to pick up the top one, and I'm going to ask Ingrid to wade in, um, which is there are, because it's an army thing. Um, there are 2.8 million students in the UK, yet OTCs, and dare I say, the other university training units can only accommodate a few thousand. Is the reserve missing a trick? So I, I think um, there are some really good examples of where uh, targeting the uh, students who are uh, time rich and cash poor uh, with uh, in, you know, a, a, a service opportunity to get basic training underway. Uh, in particular, they do that at an industrial scale in the US and Canada. We are definitely looking at what that involves. Um, but, you know, I would say, and I, I was Deputy Commandant at Sandhurst that, contr that looks after the OTCs, they are a force for good. There aren't that many of them, so there's definitely opportunity to do more in the student space. Ingrid, any points? Yeah, I think that's the point. It just comes on. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> um, 
So there have been numerous re reviews of the OTCs over the year. OTCs are actually quite an expensive um, organisation that we run. Um, there has been a rationalisation to bring separate OTCs into officer training regiments, and that obviously makes that whole process a lot more efficient. Um, and when we look at the numbers from within the OTCs who actually go on to then commission either into the regular or the reserve, actually, yes, it is a really, really good sort of, of stream of, of talent coming through. But the equally important is those who don't join the regular or the reserve army as a result, who then go out into uh, to industry and into commerce as ambassadors for what they've learnt uh, in their, with their experience of working with the military. What we currently don't do is track those people. So it's those who were in the OTC who then go off to do other things in life. And that is an initiative that is, is currently underway to work out how under data protection we're allowed to do that and maintain those contacts and to, and to build that network. And particularly where we're looking at things that we haven't really talked about, national um, defence plan and, and, and UK resilience. It's those kind of people who are out there in society who have that experience of working with the military that we need to keep, on, uh, to keep in, uh, in contact with. Brilliant. There was a question behind the straight desk. behind. Just hand them, throw them the uh, device. Oh, you've got one there. Fantastic. Uh, th thank you, Tony Allender from uh, Balfour BT. Um, just a, a quick bit of feedback, I guess, really. A another excellent day. So thank you very much to everybody for organising. Um, we talked about the whole force. We've heard from the military. We've heard from the civil service. I'm sure industry was in there somewhere. And I think just maybe... For, for future events, it might be good to hear some case studies directly from companies that are doing good stuff, small, medium, or large, um, gold, silver, or bronze. Because, you know, if this is this is obviously a partnership, uh, and I, I really like the point the gentleman made earlier about the covenant. You know, people that do sign up to it and do stuff with it, it is part of that giving back. There is it's probably that heart thing that was also mentioned. But yeah, I just wonder whether you know future events, it might be nice to hear some case studies and examples and top tips from, from industry partners, either ones that are directly, you know, MOD providers, but all those that have signed the covenant. Yeah, no, Thank I'm, you. I'm, I'm, we're going to do a wash up from this event. Uh, got, got it. It's a really good point. I mean, as we're, you know, we're tr transitioning this from being a pure sort of reserve loving uh, to being much more of a through life people conference. And therefore, you know, I think listening to, you know, having the employers as part of that um, is, is really important. So if anyone would like to participate in next year's conference, please uh, let hot and horrible bloke at the front, um, <laughs> Jacko, um, he, can, uh, he can take, uh, take, take the names. No, I Fantastic. think that's a really good point, and that's why I wanted James Cameron from Mission Motorsport on my panel, actually, because he's got a wealth of experience, particularly in the WIS yeah. cohort, but also expanding not just for Mission now, but to renewables. Um, so there's lots of learning that we can, we can take in the room, so a really good reflection back for us to make more space for that, I think, next time. Right. Uh, got hand over there. Oh, gosh, I can't see that yet. Mike over there on the far right. Far corner. Thanks. It's just actually to kind of um, coincide with a point that you made over there is that if not already, can the Covenant create a member's section for procurement for members to work together, similar to Public Contract Scotland and stuff like that, regarding we're all businesses a lot of the time, we're a recruitment company, there's construction companies, there's many companies that are signed up to the Covenant. I don't think there's a lot of collaboration with those members because a lot of the time we're only finding out by bumping into each other or LinkedIn posts, whereas if you had, had a forum on the Covenant's website, you say, look, here, I'm a business, I need help, can other members help me with that sort of thing? Or procure for MOD contracts and bring us all together rather than, you know, like bumping into events. You will do. Okay. Go on, Heather. Uh, yes. <laughs> but I would also invite any members of the audience who are in those kind of companies who could set up something far more busy uh, than perhaps the Department of Defence could. So if, you know, we've got techie companies that have signed up to the Covenant who are gold alumni winners. So that, that kind of forum would be perfect. But um, I am just inv invite one of the companies that's already signed up to perhaps take the initiative and, and to and to um, create such a forum. I think, great idea, but I could see you wanted to come in on that, Laura, Laura is it? Yeah, exactly. Um, I don't know if we can have a mic down here. It's all right. Um, just as a response to that, actually, um, same brainwave. <laughs> um, we're actually just about to start getting in touch with people who are as part of the Armed Forces Covenant to see 
who we might be interested in just that. So um, maybe I can touch base with you afterwards and connect with you first to help network. <laughs> and Jacko, do you want to say anything in terms of the DRM network and how you get people together? I know you've got an alumni network of gold winners. Yeah, no, thank you very much. And um, yeah, it's a really great question. Um, in that the catastrophic success that we heard about, you know, the numbers are quite high. Later this month, we're going to hit 10,000 Armed Forces Covenant signatories, which is phenomenal because um, the Ministry of Defence does not have a business development or a sales team that is pushing the Armed Forces um, Covenant. It is the advocacy of you in the room who deliver that. So, um, therefore, you are already, in a way, creating that network. So what we now need to do is to make sure that within the network we create a network of networks across subject matter areas that enable exactly those within the existing cohort to talk to each other so that they can get like-minded conversations going knowing that the people that they're talking to are like-minded because they come from the same community. So I would also have a say um, to, to Helen's point um, the ability for us to do that in the commercial sector and with the same expertise and acumen that exists in the commercial sector is perhaps difficult. But that doesn't mean to say that um, Defence Relation Management as an organisation working as part of the MOD but working alongside other um, uh, government departments such as the Office of Veterans Affairs because knowledge is power, data is king in everything that you do because then what you can do is you can push out the right message to the right people at the right time and you can also force multiply that back into your agenda but we can only do that by working through that network so I think it's a phenomenal point it's one that we'll take away we will look at it but please don't be surprised if we reach out and seek some assistance in bringing that together but um, the final point that I would make is is that there is an existing network um, called the Gold Award Association. We are at 642 um, this year. Uh, we're highly likely to um, increase that number by 200 plus this year. And um, again, it is an issue of how do we utilize that to best effect? So we have the Gold Award Association. The Gold Award Association has a steering group which has some terms of reference which were agreed uh, along with the Ministry of Defense. There are regional groups who deliver uh, in that space. Do we need to do that um, better? Yes, we do, because what we need to do is just to make sure that that group continues to feel that it has A, a voice into defense, and B, a voice um, collectively to those that are in that community. So, at the end of this month, um, we are gathering all of the uh, defense relationship management team together to effectively have a look at a blank sheet of paper, in a way, and say, Hey, look, you know, if we were starting this again, how might we look at doing it? And that will be right at the top of the blank sheet of paper because I think it's a phenomenal idea. So thank you very much for raising it. Great. Well, I'm going to rattle through, well, I think, three, of, three questions about the reserve. So um, <laughs> as recruitment is currently a challenge, can we improve retention of reservists by increasing up, um, upper age limits and offering short tasks or roles with less RSDs? I absolutely think we can uh, do short project, you know, get better at short project type uh, engagements. Goes back to that um, uh, accessing of talent and this whole sort of continuum of service, you know, uh, and, and offering that the, the opportunities uh, that you know you can uh, engage with, um, you know, we need to maximise. Um, are we looking to increase upper age limits? Well, actually, in terms of different um, categories of service, whether it's strategic reserve. Um, or uh, homeland defence, you know, we, we can absolutely look at that. So this is, you know, in the cooking at the moment, um, but it's all part of that wider utility of the, uh, and, and access to talent that we talk about. Comparison with other nations' reserve forces, um, we are uh, part of the uh, uh, NATO Reserve Forces um, Committee, and uh, the employer engagement piece is a big part of that. Um, from what we're seeing, there are, you know, some really good examples, especially in the U.S., but we're pretty, um, pretty swept up. I think, as Jack has said, 10,000 Armed Forces Covenants is seen as, a, as, as an exemplar in this space. Uh, we are looking at an international engagement um, on employer engagement um, uh, and, and working out what that could look like. But it is, um, you know, I think it's fair to say that we're slightly ahead of most, but always looking uh, at what others are doing. Will employers be consulted as part of the Haith one Thwaite review, is that? It's probably one for me. Yeah, that's for you. Uh, so there's, there's, three, there's probably three answers to that, and I don't know if James is in the audience. 
So the first one is during the course of Haythorn Week, yes, there has been. Uh, there has been quite a lot of um, employers, but also external stakeholders engagement. The second part is that there have been um, a number of very deliberate sort of engagements with industry and employers to red team some of the, um, so the, the sort of challenge function around some of the recommendations that are coming out from that. We expect the report to be, uh, you know, to be presented to the Secretary of State by, you know, in the next couple of months. And what the area where I think the employer engagement is going to be absolutely key is on identifying those recommendations that they come out and how we move some of those towards, towards implementation. So in both the cooking and the eating, as it were, to steal Mark's uh, um, little thing, there, there has been a lot of employee engagement and we will be entirely reliant on that as we go into the next stage of the, the review. So a pop-up reserve centre, that sounds fascinating. Roger, are you in the audience? No? Oh, okay, that's, uh, yeah. we have pop-up restaurants, pop-up reserve centres. Um, I think it's fair to say we are actually, and as mentioned earlier, but we have a thing called Reserve Estate uh, Optimization Plan uh, that's um, really starting to gather some pace, going back to what Ingrid said about some of the reserve centres being slightly antiquated in the wrong parts of the forest. Uh, you know, engaging with our reserve community, offering them digitally, uh, uh, digitally um, access, getting them accommodation, feeding, kit, uh, all some of the, the basics, um, you know, there's more work to be done there, and that's absolutely what we're getting after. Haven't included temporary venues in that, but uh, we can certainly feed that in. Um, DMS, Sponsorship Programme for Healthcare Professionals. Um, I, this is a partnering with industry that I think once we've identified in health, in medic skills are absolutely ahead of the curve here, but we should be doing that more, uh, more in we've got industrial level. To step into teaching, we've got to step into unified professions, as well, uniform professions, so policing, firefighting. Any others? Uh, there are others, but I was going to take a slightly different angle to it. And funny enough, I was speaking to Peter Homer only yesterday, who's the Director General of the Defence Medical Services. And um, in, a num in a number of other uh, currently pinch point trades, th th this approach is exactly what we're looking at doing. And there will probably be two or three pilots in the course of the next 12 months or so that looks to, um, that looks to learn many of the lessons from what uh, Peter and the team have done at, uh, at DMS. Interesting. I think, Joel, that's, uh, if Strat Command was in the room, they, they would be very seized by that. The ability at a defence level to access talent is a thing that, um, if Commander Strat Command was in here, he'd be saying this is the most important thing, getting hold of that specialist talent. Um, and he is a great component of us digitalising that talent service and uh, having a continuum service that is uh, allowing greater visibility within the silos of the single services to pull the right person out uh, and or people out and be able to access those skills. So that is absolutely um, the main effort. We have a strong... We have strong and practical commitment to supporting reserves. We want to be better at encouraging staff to seriously consider reserve service. So, Guy, are you in the audience? Ah, what do, go on, do you want to unpack a little bit on... Are we back to executive stretch and getting uh, people out in the field to experience a reserve service? Yeah, go for it. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, it's just that we've done as much as we can in terms of support, additional leave. We go above the 10 days to basically they can have any time off almost they want to do it. Um, we promote I'll, it. I'll come and join your organisation. Yeah, no, feel free. <laughs> um, it's just how do we kind of reach into a, quite a young workforce that's probably never even considered it in a very practical way? We've got oh, yeah. such a huge talent pool that would be perfect for it but it doesn't appear on in we push it there's just no kind of radar connection really I mean getting them to experience and, and breaking down the barriers it's, it's a bit of the shock of capture going into a reserve center or, or you know signing it or going onto the website you know breaking that down and open days going to you know executive stretch variants of um, you know actually getting them to experience it Anthony, what do you think from a cadet perspective? How do we do it? Well, I, think, well, I, don't th I don't think there's any one magical solution to it. I think it's just um, events like this and just raising awareness. And, um, and you know, many of the adult volunteers in our space, for example, are reticent about declaring their hand that they're an adult volunteer because they feel that um, they'll be judged as somebody who can't give 110% to their employer. 
because if you've got a little bit of juice left in the squeeze, then you squeeze harder because we're all trying to do as well as we can in our businesses. And it's acknowledging that um, it's encouraging them to put their hand up. It's us encouraging the adult volunteers to put their hands up as well. And um, I think we come at it from both ends, but I can't think of any other more formal way of doing it. Great stuff. I think we're pretty much done. Can I thank my... Uh, two amigos for their support today. Um, I think it's been massively successful, but, you know, Jacko um, and the team, you know, have done a great job, but want to get your feedback. Uh, we want to evolve this. We want to build on what I think is now a different type of set of uh, discussions that we're having. Um, we are going to move forward in, in defense in terms of the things that uh, we discussed. The integrated review, refresh, a refocused RF30, the Heathorn-Thwaite review, and a whole load of other change programs are gonna go on between now and the next time we meet. But um, I think we're, you know, message from this uh, floor is that we're open to that discussion. We want to engage. Um, we're thinking about a more flexible hybrid, uh, dynamic workforce management. Um, you're part of that. And the conversation is, 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 is now starting to happen and uh, we welcome your feedback. So thank you very much for coming today and uh, safe home. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, team.